Pastor Stuart asked me to speak about our mission call and uh, Rob and I are what we call home missioners. We have actually uh, gone on a journey which I'm going to share with you today. But we, um, we're not missionaries over to the other countries, although we have done that. But in our retirement, we, we're missionaries to Australia. And interestingly enough, I mean, Australia is a mission field. Amen. Yeah. yeah. But interestingly enough, the nations are coming to Australia. So we're actually ministering multiculturally very much. Just two weeks ago, we were in a Congolese church where they had to interpret for us. You know, in our land of Australia, many of the churches we go to have to interpret for us so that their people can understand. So we're ministering to Indians and um, many different Africans, Kenyans, Congolese, um, can't even think of all the other churches in, in Africa that we've ministered to in Australia uh, in our own language with it being interpreted. So we've got the mission field without having to travel, which I think is pretty exciting. So here's going through a little bit of our journey. Uh, the first photo there, this is, this is the beginning of my journey. I wouldn't be here if this hadn't happened. This is my father. And my father was about to dive off the pier at Mornington when a car came along and tooted and alerted him and he gave them his attention and the car driver said, there's a shark in the water just where you're going to dive. Oh. Waiting for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. So my life was saved then. It was. <laughs> now in uh, in 1935, my, my father became a, a Christian a bit earlier than that. He was a, a, um, a non-believer. Then he became a Christian. And then he uh, studied Bible prophecy and the book of Revelation, uh, the national message there. Some of you may be familiar with it. And the historicist message, which is that we are actually living in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. And uh, Dad had, a, in the common... Um, thinking in those days was that we've got the whole book of Revelation ahead of us, which is called the Futurist View. Uh, but Dad went back previously to what they used to believe in the past and found out that that was only a fairly new belief that had come in with the Catholic Church, and that way back it really was Revelation 16. And so he got uh, really keen on this. He used to go around preaching, and then he, he and on one of these preaching tours, he met my mother. And the story is, folks, that... He took her around the back of his caravan the first night they met and what? kissed her. What? No, I know. It's shocking. In 1935? Yes. Wow. Yes. So there, there he is with his car. He used to go around preaching in it. And there he is with his car and he changed his car into a caravan. In 1935, one of the first ones on the road. So there you see it's the same car but it's got the back on it. And inside the back were two beds, one for him as he went around preaching all around Australia and one for his projectionist because he had a projector. Doesn't look like our data projector, true. It was called a lantern slide projector. Have you ever heard of those? So they had glass slides. So he had made up for his series of talks as he went around Australia, a whole lot of sermons on glass slides. And this is this is the actual one. This is his, it's in the Mornington Museum. And that shows you the workings of it. So that was very precious to him to illustrate his, his talks. So here he is, that handsome dude, is my father. And the arrow's pointing to my grandmother, and that's at our place at Frankston, which was a, a um, because we've got, we had our own tennis court and, and um, service courses and goodness knows what. And uh, the, I mean, that's all very exciting, but the really exciting thing to me about Frankston is that there was a real move of God there. When I was a child, I grew up in that house and the Spirit of God was hovering over it. It was the birthplace of revival of the CRC because my father started the CRC in Victoria. And in, in, at one stage, Hundreds of people were coming to our house and being baptised in the Spirit and getting the touch of God in their lives. Quite, quite an amazing story. It's all in the book. So there's my mum now. I don't think they were married at this stage. 
with his car. And so then he took his car all the way over to Western Australia. This is what the road would have been like. And he went all around Western Australia and South Australia preaching. But he also went around the world. And he is, he's only 29, but he is in uh, the radio, on the radio in Cannes, Canada, 1938. He had a great radio ministry. And then he took the Melbourne Town Hall twice, once when he was aged 27 and once when he was aged 31, filled the building. There were 3,000 feet in Melbourne Town Hall. And there were up to 3,000 outside that couldn't get in because traffic jams and the police and goodness knows what, and they said, don't ever do this again. You have to issue tickets. <laughs> we can't have this mayhem. But that people will want to know about end time events, and that's what he was preaching on, the world today in Bible prophecy. Now, all this is significant to our story because we, uh, we are heirs of all this. So there's mum and dad. So this is what uh, dad used to, and that's my uncle, they used to preach on the radio every single Sunday and they've got great followings and what happened were people would write into them and they'd get their names and addresses and as a result of that, they would plant churches because they'd say, oh, okay, we've got three families from Geelong. Let's go down and start a church down there. And that's what happened. Now, Rob took over the radio program when my dad retired and he was on the radio every week for years too. So that's my mother and father. They preached in Maryborough. Does anybody remember them? No, you're all too young, aren't you? <laughs> so here's the call coming to us now. So Rob and I got married 51 years ago. Woo! Sounds amazing, doesn't it? But we were young and good looking. <laughs> Still are. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we joined together because we had common goals. I was looking for a husband who wanted to serve God and he was looking for a wife who wanted to serve God. So right back there at the beginning, our passion was for people to receive Jesus as Saviour, for people to be filled with the Spirit and for people to use the gifts of the Spirit. And so before we even met, we had both ministered in children's church. And before we even met, we both become youth leaders. And then when we married, we became pastors. This our two sons. They're lovely. They love me. I love them. And they're really um, part of our ministry in that they, they pray for us and believe for us and back us up and give us great ideas. So here's the response. After we got married, we pastored for 35 years full-time on a full-time salary and uh, we pastored the church in Richmond, which was the original CRC church. And then we planted a church in Burwood in the eastern suburbs. And then we pastored Swan Hill and we pastored Ballarat. While we were doing that, we were going around preaching in other churches a lot separately. I had my own group of churches that I used to preach in regularly and Bob had his. And uh, we, then we retired. And uh, Rob said to me, well, we've been planning for a long time that when we retired, we would get on the road and go around preaching all these churches that we had a visiting ministry at. Uh, Rob actually said to me when we retired, he said, you know, Liz, I've counted up and there's 50 churches that are ready to have a, our ministry as soon as we retire. So now it's grown up to 160. Wow. wow. We go around 160 churches about every four years. Just rotating around Australia. So... Uh, when we retired, we had we had planned financially to be able to buy a van, and there's a photo of the van down the bottom. So we our, our our love is to teach. We love to take a group of people and teach them something from the Word of God. We love to train people, and we often find ourselves training the leadership in churches or or, or mentoring the leadership or mentoring pastors. And, and being a prophetic voice in the generation. So that's what our mission and our call is. So there's our van. It is a big fellow. Some of you will have seen it parked here. Do any of you remember when we had it parked there? Yes. Okay. So this time we parked out on, on a bit of acreage. It's, it's like this much on either side of the gate when we're going to your place. It's good. We're glad to have it. But it's a bit... <laughs> what do we call? Heart in your mouth. Heart in your mouth. That's the one. 
So inside is quite roomy. We've had a meeting of 13 people in there. And it's used so much. Actually, one woman, lady pastor, went in there and she said, oh, government. I've got anointing of government. It's in, the, in these very walls, government. And she said, you've been used to change churches and their government. And that was true because not long before that, we had actually ministered to a pastor that it was time for him to retire. And he, he, he realised it was and he successfully retired and he's just so happy. And uh, so we have been changing the governments of churches too. It's ministering to leaders, showing them how to do their finances and how to uh, run churches and different resources. We're, we're full of resources that we hand on freely to other people. So this fan with its room in there is very important to us to be able to have a group of people in there and minister to them. We don't just minister to pastors. We've had people in there with broken hearts coming in and being prayed for. Actually, um, Lynn, no, I'm not saying she had a broken heart, but she, she came into our van and talked to us, did not you? Chris. Chris, I mean. Yeah. I mean Chris. You know, I say him, but I mean Chris. Yeah. yeah. Chris. Yeah. Yes. She came in one day. So we often have people coming in there just chatting, having a drink or uh, just praying. And uh, so it's, it's important to us to have that room to be able to minister freely with people. So our ministry um, is, is all over Australia. We've taken the van up to Cairns twice, uh, ministering at churches on the way up and on the way back. Uh, we've taken it to Tasmania twice, gone around the island ministering. And we've been a lot around New South Wales. There's a lot of churches in New South Wales that, are, that we are connected with and a lot of churches in South Australia and a lot of churches in Victoria. They're the three mainly populated places, particularly that have got CRC churches. But we don't just minister in the CRC. Well, next week we're going to the AOG and the week after we're going to the Baptist. And we've been just week before to the full gospel assembly. So we are working around other churches as well. So uh, we haven't actually been to the Northern Territory. If it hadn't been for the restrictions, we, would have, we were planning last year an extensive trip, ministering in churches up there right up to Tennant Creek. Um, and, but the, we were leaving on the Sunday and the lockdown happened on the Friday. So that killed that plan. Uh, so, yeah, Queensland we've been to quite a bit and Western Australia. We haven't actually taken the van to Western Australia, but we've flown across twice and ministered over there. And uh, that's, our, that's our mission field. Wow. This is a school. Uh, we love going here. It's a highlight every year. It's a Christian school, but it's a Pentecostal school. And so the principal who's the on fire Pentecostal guy, uh, he knew I had a children's ministry and so about six years ago he said to me, Liz, I want you to come in and I want you to go to every class and pray for every child to speak in tongues. Wow. Yep. So every year we do that. There are 1,000 students in the school. We teach them how to be filled with the Spirit, why they should be filled with the Spirit, and we also teach them how to hear from God, how to get prophetic words and how to move in the Spirit. So that is awesome. There's another school that we're going to go into too next year possibly and do the same thing. But most schools don't open us up. I'm a teacher and I've worked in lots of Christian schools and most of them won't open you up to actually praying for the baptism in the Spirit. They don't mind the kids being born again. We, we were doing CRE and a lot of the churches closed us down. We wouldn't let us come in anymore. Mm. A lot of the schools, I mean, schools, yeah. Well, um, we do have an ungodly premier, mm. and he has worked very hard to get mm. Christianity out of the schools. It's all right as long as you don't do it in the school hours. You do it last I know, they made, he made it really difficult. He made right. so many rules. You had to pay for all your own curriculum, you had to do it after hours. Yeah. It, it had to be, it was uncomfortable the kids didn't like it and yeah, yeah. so we've got to pray for the premier in christian schools thankfully they're still withholding uh, all those laws and rules from going into christian schools so we can be thankful for that okay uh then uh with my children's vision this is kingston church in melbourne they would like me to come back every year and minister to the children there so that they'll all be filled with the Spirit and 
uh, be able to hear from God, get prophetic words. So that's me there one year. And uh, then we've got adults, of course, that we minister to. This is Murray Bridge. It's uh, the biggest church in the CRC. They've got a thousand people that associate with the church. And there's Rob preaching to them. And so that's what we do every um, eight months of the year. We have planned an itinerary, like this time, we're away for seven weeks. We're going to seven churches all over in the western suburbs. We try to get a geographic area rather than going shh, shh, shh. And so we just go from one church to another. We spend a week in each church doing what we've done here, meeting with the people at all the meetings that they have or putting on extra meetings. And then we uh, minister on the weekends as well. So uh, eight months of the year, we, we do that in between times. We, we usually wait anything up to three months, then we've got a home, we've got a home in Melbourne, and uh, have a bit of a rest. And it's not much of a rest because the garden, one time we came home and the lawn was like this, wasn't it? <coughs> so you have to rush around and do things, catch up with your family and do maintenance and goodness knows what, and then we get on the road again, off we go. So one of the ministries we have branched out into in our missions is writing books and uh, sorry, camera. I told you how my kids helped us in the ministry. Well, one of my sons, uh, he said to me, he, both our sons have been saying for ages, you should write books. You should write books. You're going to go one day. You won't be here and all these truths that you're sharing won't be around. And we go, oh, books, you know, how do you write a book? And uh, so one day my son said to me, Mum, when you preach, um, when Dad preaches, get the CDs of his sermons and give them to me. So I did. And that Christmas, he handed a bundle to Rob, all wrapped up, and Rob unwrapped it, and there was a book. And our son Nathan said, there you are, Dad, there's the book you've written. He goes, what? And sure enough, it said, Everyday Miracles by Rob Bailey. So he opened it up and there was all his sermons from CDs put into a book. And Nathan had paid someone to transcribe it all from his CDs into the book. And then he and his uh, employee spent a whole week just editing it and moving it around and, and, and making it more readable. And, and he handed it on to Rob and we went, wow, that was an easy way to write a book. And so we both spent um, months uh, just editing it and adding stuff to it and taking away stuff. And, and that, that became this book here, which is um, for $15, Everyday Miracles. And in it, Rob put 50 stories of things that have happened in his ministry and added scriptures and uh, just sorted it out a little bit, took out some repetitive stuff and made it into this book. So um, it's, it's amazing that, you know, Rob was a bread baker before he got... Um, spiritualized into the ministry and you don't do much training when you're a bread baker how to write a book so i'm justifiably proud that my husband has got into print and then so i said all right i'm going to write some books and so uh i i um put my thoughts together on things that i've been preaching on for many many years and discovery on motivational gifts is from romans 12 and I had done a seminar on this many times. But one particular time, a lady came up to me and she said, Liz, if I had known what was in that book, I would still be married. She said, I married a man who became a Baptist minister and we were in ministry, but the whole time I tried to change him into somebody that he wasn't. But she said, I realise now from what you're saying that I should have left him alone and let him be the man God had created him to be. But I ruined his life, I ruined our marriage, and he's no longer in ministry. So that's why we feel that book's important. And then the baptism in the spirit, uh, Rob often says he thinks I'm the, per the person in Australia who's prayed for more people to be baptised in the spirit than anyone else possibly through, but certainly of all the people that we know. So we put everything we knew into that book. And a lot's got my name on it. It's really actually got some of Rob's stuff in it. <laughs> he Heals the Brokenhearted is a book about uh, healing people who have got sad memories, painful memories, 
things they'd rather never happen to them and how Jesus came to set them free. I was standing near this book the other day and a girl walked past and she said to her friend, that book fixed me. Mm. Now that's pretty cool. And then there's this, the life story of Dad, which Dad actually wrote. And it's all about the things that I was telling you and more, more miracles of, of what happened in his life and how he started the CRC and all that kind of stuff. And really interesting. And do people manipulate you? Do people control you? Do they boss you? How do you get out of that? And that, that's all in those books. And we've also got a USB with 11 video sermons of ours on it, but we've run out. So uh, you asked about the impact of our ministry. I'm going through these headings, by the way, that Pastor Stewart gave me. <laughs> I don't know whether you realise that, but I'm going through systematically what you gave me. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, he asked about me to share about the impact on individuals. And this is this week, so we thought we'd bring you something fresh. Some of you who did the Bible study with us have heard this before, but many of you haven't. Recently, we visited some friends in Ballarat. And they told us about their teenage son, uh, how he was suffering from shyness and social anxiety. And he thought, um, you know, he would, wouldn't amount to much because he was so shy. But the Holy Spirit spoke to him through a prophecy that I gave him and that he realised that that he was going to have to do something. Now, when we give a prophecy to somebody, we say there are three things that you need to do. You need to listen to it again and write down the dot points of what that prophecy is saying to you. And get, secondly, to get somebody who knows you and loves you, cares for you, uh, to listen to that prophecy and to add anything that they think that you've missed, that the prophecy is saying to you that you've missed. So add that to your list. And then if you believe that it's God, you have a right to re accept or reject the prophetic word. But if you believe it's from God, then you need to pursue it. And this young man uh, in his mid-teens, he realised this and he began to... Um, make some changes in his life. One of the things that he did wherever he went, he went up to people and shook their hands and introduced himself, which was way, way, way out of his comfort zone. But he was pursuing what the Spirit of God had said to him, that he would have a voice and that he would be an influence for good and for the kingdom of God. And so he was doing things that would take him on that journey to uh, be the person that God wanted him to be. So he consciously made an effort to introduce himself by shaking hands and saying things, getting involved in con conversations, etc. And he activated the prophetic word that had been given to him by the Holy Spirit through myself. Now he confidently speaks his thoughts <clears throat> wherever he is, and he has consulted and has won the hearts and minds of the people he's working with and working for. He's now 24 year old and he says God has totally changed his life and his lifestyle. Thank you. We, um, we love hearing feedback, we love hearing stories like that. So that, that's just really fresh. So uh, Rob is going to give prophetic words to those of you who haven't received one this trip in a minute, but you can't wait. So the impact on churches. Uh, I've got a video here that tells you if the, oh. Wow, it's not showing the picture. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Technical. Uh, it would have been much better in his words, but this is just uh, Trevor Murphy. He's the state chairman for New South Wales. Really godly, amazing man with incredible talents and abilities. And he uh, is just—he's introducing us into a church to minister at, and he just is saying how um, I can't remember what he says. <laughs> just how wonderful we are. <laughs> Um, how we, we move into a church and we just uh, move among the people and we don't make a fuss and we don't expect a fuss and we don't uh, expect special meetings and we just flow in with the life of the church. And that's what he's saying. Is it Rob Jenny, you remember? He, he's a, a great guy. He actually passes the town that he has his church in. People can't, We went out for lunch with him, or we were going out for lunch with him, and as we were going up the street, he was actually uh, greeting people that he knew, uh, people in the town, from prominent people to just everyday people. And he would spend time, you know, five minutes with them while we were supposed to be going for lunch. <laughs> I hope it took about half an hour to get from, from one, one place to around the corner to, to where the restaurant was. Because he met so many people and just ministered to them naturally and spoke to them and encouraged them in what they were doing and just being a pastor to that town. Mm. My hero. So, impact on the kingdom. If you have a look at the little picture, you'll see the kind of impact we like to have. flattened by the word of God. Yep, yeah, that's the way to go. I love it. Now this is another video, so it may not work. Yeah, it's working. Oh, it is working if you want to put the sound on. So we are hoping uh, that you will get excited about missions too. We, we're not saying go to India or Pakistan or somewhere, but you can be missionaries to Maribyrnong. You can be missionaries to Coles. You can be missionaries to Woolworths. How can you do that? It's not that difficult. It says in the Bible, Jesus said, go to all the world. That's the people who are able to. 
and preach the gospel to all creation. These signs will accompany those who believe. We all believe you, don't we? We all believe? Yeah. Yeah. So these are the signs that will accompany you. In my name, they will drive out demons. And I think that when we're praying for the sick, often we think we're praying for the sick, but we're really sending demons on their way. Have you ever prayed for somebody and you've been aware that an evil presence has gone from them? Yes. So we're driving out demons. We're speaking in new tongues as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you will place hands on the sick, and what's going to happen? They'll get well. Yeah. So that's our commission. That's our call. It's not, it just doesn't say pastors. Does it say pastors there anywhere? No. It just says believers. So our call is to go out into the supermarkets, out into the coffee places, out into the op shop, and share Jesus. And Rob and I what like to do that even when we're busy doing stuff like buying petrol or whatever it is and to share jesus be awake to hear when god is going to tell you that person i've called you speak to them about jesus you know a lot of people are going around there just saying jesus loves you that's what they're saying jesus loves you and he has a plan for your life it's not hard to say that is it let's say it together jesus, jesus loves you and he has a plan for your life and you're giving life, you're probably speaking the best words they've heard for a month, a year, just telling them that Jesus loves them, because people feel so unloved these days, and Jesus has a plan for their life. That's miracle words. So that's how you can be a missionary. It costs you nothing. Well, it does cost a bit of pride. But you won't have the big expenses that the people have who travel around in big vans that break down. You just got to go in your ordinary day, day to day, and share Jesus. So I want to encourage you to all be missionaries. Next week when you come back with your testimony, say, I did it. I spoke to a complete stranger about Jesus. I prayed for the lady who had just fallen over and hurt her knee, and she got healed. Just be there. Just be open. Be ready. Be listening. And God will suddenly tap you on the shoulder and say, that one. Go talk to that one. Share Jesus. You know, I've been in restaurants, and not much lately, but I have been in restaurants. <laughs> financial look down. Um, and, and God said to me, go and speak to that person at the table over there. True. And I've actually sat down with them <laughs> and had time with them. Or, or uh, he'll go and say, uh, in the shops, go and speak to someone. And, and Rob and I are just used to each other just disappearing. He'll, he'll go and say, I'm just going to speak to that waiter. Go for it, darling. Or I'll say, look, I just feel I've got to go and talk to that person at that table over there. Go for it, Liz. And we're trying to listen to God, sharing Jesus. There's a hurting world out there. They don't know him. And they don't know he loves them. And we can share it. So that can be your mission along with my mission. Okay? So this morning, I would like if you would, um, if you've got something wrong with your body and you need healing, to stand up now. Because he sent us to lay hands on the sick and they will get better. Okay? Anyone else? So I'd like you to uh, put your hand on that place that's affected, if you can. And uh, is there anyone in the congregation, if you look at these two precious folks, and, and you feel God is saying, see, listen to God, this is what we're doing. Listen to God. God speak right now to you. And if he's saying to you, go and lay hands on Carol, go and lay hands on Gary, go and do it. Don't say, oh, but I lost my temper this morning. Nothing to do with it. Don't say, oh, but I didn't pray in tongues yesterday. Nothing to do with it. Get up and go and lay hands on them. Off you go. If God's speaking to you, be listening to him. What's he saying? You will see, I really think God is telling you, but you've got to listen and you've got to obey. Off you go. All right. We've got. Oh, that's why you're delayed. Tell me, pick it up. Get my phone. Somebody pray for you. Come on. Yeah, Darren. Thank you. I've got a very sore. Yes, be healed in Jesus' name. 
being ill in Jesus' name. Those of you who are watching here, you put your hand on that part of your body that's pain or sick or disease. Put your hand on that body right now. Or if you've got someone else in the room with you, get them to put their hand on the body. Now in Jesus' name, I'm going to speak healing. He said he sent his word and healed them. And I'm sending his word now and you're going to be healed. In Jesus' name, I command that pain to leave right now. We take authority over that pain and we say, go in the name of Jesus. And I speak to that illness and I say, be healed in Jesus' name. I speak to that sickness and I say, go in Jesus' name. Set the captive free. Jesus came to bring healing to the nations. And you be healed now in Jesus' name. Elsie had a bad back when she came to the study on Friday. She said, Rob, can you pray for me? Or one of us, we laid hands on her, on her back. She came the next day and she said, I'm healed. That pain is gone. That's what Jesus comes to do, to heal us. Okay, so you believe that Jesus healed you. Great testimony. By his stripes, I am healed. How fantastic. Okay, so if anyone here would like to be baptised in the Spirit, the other thing it said there was that we should we would speak in other tongues. So if you want to have the glorious experience of being baptised in the Spirit and speaking in tongues, if you'd just like to stand up, we can pray for you now. Probably most of you already are, I understand that. But those of you who are listening, if you want to speak in tongues, the only thing that's stopping you speaking in tongues is you. You don't have to get sinless. <laughs> You don't have to get pure in heart. You don't have to work hard to do it. These are gifts of grace. You just open your mouth and start to speak. Let's just do it all now. We encourage these people who are online. Just open your mouth and start to speak in a 